then hydrogen then another is a hydrogen generation then it is a dehydration then environmental catalysis like exhaust gas emissions water treatment and all so exhaust gas emissions and all you must be aware of the catalytic converters which are present in uh, nowadays all the two wheelers four wheelers trucks etc etc so all the vehicles so they have the catalytic uh, converter so those catalytic converters have the catalyst which is a heterogeneous catalyst and it does the cleaning of the exhaust gases so those can convert harmful gases into non harmful gases per se like for instance if the co carbon monoxide is emitted then it can be on the catalyst can be converted into co2 nox can be converted into nitrogen etc etc and also for the water treatment heterogeneous catalysis can be used now going further in heterogeneous catalysis there are two basic basic categories one is a metal catalyst and another is a acid based catalyst so these are the very broad two categories in heterogeneous catalysis so now let's go uh, to some metal catalyst so metal catalyst is like supported metal catalyst so metal catalyst can be uh, non supported also and supported also but maybe we can just talk about the supported metal catalyst uh, so i will give some few examples also over here so this is a typical surface of a catalyst or support for instance if you want to really synthesize a catalyst for instance maybe students might be learning uh, that maybe ruthenium on carbon is used as a hydrogenation catalyst or nickel on carbon is used as a hydrogenation reaction catalyst so this must be taught in your masters and bachelors and all so typically when you talk about carbon or any other support then it has a this is typically a structure like you have the terrace you have the ledge you have the vacancy you have the king surface then it is a king add atom then ledge add atom surface add atoms and all so we will not go much into the details of it because this itself if you just start talking about the surface of it it will take maybe a day to explain what exactly all these keywords or uh, all these words uh, are mean but just to give you a brief that even if you think that it is a surface the surface is not that easy for instance the surface is exactly like for instance your road if you are going on a road then maybe somewhere you will have the a uh, tar road somewhere you might be having the concrete road somewhere you might be having the potholes somewhere you might be having some grass grown over it something like that so you just imagine that it is kind of a road surface which is a not homogeneous but it is a kind of a heterogeneous surface so the same is represented over here in another diagram so now what we do is suppose if we really want to do a supported metal catalyst synthesis so what we do is we take this uh, support in a solvent then we add a metal precursor so metal precursor can be uh, for instance nickel chloride let's take a nickel catalyst for instance and then what you do you just mix them together in a solvent then you do the stirring you do the drying and then you finally do the calcination addition so all these steps are very very important because stirring at room temperature for how long you are doing with what concentration you are doing and all is very very important so uh, let's not go much into the details of those because then it would be a really a long discussion then you do the drying and then after, afterwards to kind of uh, uh, you know to kind of bind that metal on uh, your surface you have to do the calcination and reduction so calcination means you can convert this nickel chloride into nickel oxide form and then in the reduction maybe nickel oxide can be converted into uh, nickel reduced form so that is what normally we do and that is what is practiced now once you do that so what happens this is the surface you know uh, which we discussed some two slides back and then what happens is then there would be a metal particle sitting on it so it metal particle can be on the terrace metal particle can be on the uh, near the ledge atom nickel particle can be at the uh, king surface or something like that so just imagine that the metal can go and sit at any place over here and where it sits also can uh, change the properties of the catalyst but let's not go much into the details of it then there is another aspect here you can see that the yellow is a support and then there would be a metal particle like this and then you will have a high coordinated sides or low coordinated sides and all let's not go much into the details because otherwise it will be again a long long uh, talk about it so you just imagine that there will be a metal which is sitting on uh, uh, just a
<coughs> sir how's nahi tan sir uh, i think uh, there is a phone call yeah, sorry sorry there was a call and then i tried to cut the call two times but then still the person was calling third time so i have to take otherwise it will be a continuous disturbance so okay. sorry so going coming back uh, uh, now where the metal can sit on the surface so let's not go much into the details of it because it will be a long long discussion so just imagine that metal is sitting somewhere on the support right now going further see you know, must be aware of this adsorption desorption phenomena for instance this i have taken an example of ammonia synthesis so in ammonia synthesis you have the hydrogen and nitrogen which is uh, which is uh, interacting with each other on a Fe catalyst. So just imagine that hydrogen is there, which comes and sits on the Fe catalyst. Nitrogen also comes and sits on the Fe catalyst. Over there, it gets split into H and N, and then finally some reaction happens, and you get the ammonia back. So what happens is this is the adsorption, and this is the desorption. So once uh, ammonia is formed, it will desorb. But for uh, reaction to happen, first hydrogen and nitrogen has to Come in contact with the catalyst. So this is called the adsorption, and then there would be a desorption. So this is a multi, uh, you know, uh, multi-step uh, process. You can have a surface process or a bulk process. So the molecules are coming, they are interacting, and then they are going out and all. So I will not go again much of uh, the details of it. You must have heard about Le Chatelier's principle and all. So I will not go much into the details. Uh, no, uh, into the details of that. Now, what is important is that you may ask that okay, uh, there is a possibility that when you impregnate or when you put a metal on a catalyst or a, on a support surface, a metal can be of different size. A metal can be of a small size, it can be of a big size, it can be of a very big size, and all. So, whether the activity of the catalyst changes, yes, typically. Uh, many of the reactions, which are we call at those as a structure sensitive reactions. So structure sensitive reactions means that if you have a change in the particle size of the metal, which is supported on the uh, support, then maybe your activity changes. So that change happens because of the electronic structure and also because of the geometric structure. So geometric structure is this one and electronic structure is uh, uh, something to do with the support metal interaction, and whether the metal is in the uh, electron rich form or in the electron deficient form and all. I will not go much into the details of it at this moment. Maybe in one of the example, I will talk about it slightly. So whether the activity of the catalyst changes. Yes, as I said that in a structure sensitive reaction, the activity will vary. Now, you can see there are some examples over here. This is the oxidation of ethane. You can see that uh, there is a conversion, there is a temperature, and then there is an effect of particle size. So you can see that if you have a smaller particle, like 1.5 nanometer, and then if you have a 6.3 nanometer size of the metal particle, then there is a change in the activity. Very easily you can see from this figure. Same is true with the pyrrole hydrogenation. Here also the selectivity for the product, like butylamine or maybe uh, pyrrolidone, uh, pyrrolidine will be changing based on the uh, based on the size of the platinum for instance over here so if it is a 0.8 nanometer and if it goes to 5 nanometer this uh, activity changes the selectivity changes and all so that is what we call it as a structure sensitive reaction so what we have to keep in mind that when we are choosing a support the support should be as much homogeneous as much possible like there should not be many many different surfaces and when we are making a catalyst at the same time, the catalyst should be made or a metal which has a, um, supported on the support should be of the size which we want. For instance, if we want to have more of a butylamine, then we have to have the particle size slightly bigger, more than two nanometer. If we want to have more of a pyrrolidone, then maybe uh, we have to have the particle size smaller. So that all comes into the picture when we synthesize the catalyst, how we synthesize the catalyst. Now there is a possibility that there is a deactivation of the uh, catalyst. So this is called as a sintering effect. So normally deactivation can happen in many ways, but I'll just uh, discuss over here uh, one cause of deactivation, which is called as a sintering. 
So what happens is normally if you have this type of a particles which are very close to each other, then there would be possibility that they start coming together and then there will be a small pore here and then finally that pore will go and it will form a big particle. So it is also shown over here, it is an inter-particle sintering that these two particles of metal can move during the reaction and then they can come together and form a bigger particle. So if this happens, naturally your selectivity, your performance of the catalyst will change as we have seen in the earlier slide that if you have a uh, if you have a difference in the particle size, then the activity will change. So this is the mechanism of sintering. This is very uh, crude way of showing it. You can see that the particles are moving and then they are giving the bigger particle. And that way the particles will form bigger, right? And this is how uh, the activity of the catalyst will change. Now, if we really want to overcome this uh, deactivation, what, could, what should be done? So again, let's see this uh, uh, animation over here. The particles are coming together and then it will form a bigger particle, right? So your activity will change. Now, if you really want to uh, avoid that, what you can do is your particles may change, but then I can put something in between and then maybe the sintering may not happen. So there will be a disturbance, right? So how to create that disturbance? You can create that dis disturbance by putting some uh, inhibitors or promoters or something like that in the catalyst manufacture. So to go further, this is the effect of promoter, which always I show uh, to at many places, very easy reaction to understand. So this is a citral, citral can go into the nerol. So typically the catalyst is platinum catalyst with tin on alumina. So you can see that if I use only platinum as a catalyst on the alumina as a support, I get only 20% selectivity for mineral formation. But the moment I add tin, then the, my activity boosts from 20% to 83%. So there is no much change in the catalyst, but only change is I added 3% tin in the catalyst and my activity has gone from 20% to 83%. Same is the example for Cara1 to Cara wall. So you can see that with uh, only platinum as a uh, metal, you can get 30% selectivity for caravel, but when you uh, add a tin into that, then it will go into 70%. So there is a change in the activity. There is an improvement in the selectivity for the product formation, right? So this is one of the example, which is from my group only. Uh, so maybe I heard that uh, Sagar Bhavasar Matsagar, who is your ex-student, you mentioned to me that Anup Tatur has given a talk in the college and he must have given this example uh, in his uh, presentation, I'll just briefly mention about it since he might have already uh, uh, mentioned about it. So the conversion of xylose into uh, sugar alcohol like xylitol, for instance, xylose to xylitol. So you can see here that it is a platinum metal, which is either on alumina or silica alumina, or this is a carbon material. You can see that I am keeping 2% platinum on this uh, support, but the change in support changes my product distribution. So these are the products. I will not go into the much details of it, but you can see from here that product distribution is changing. Same is the case in the case of ruthenium uh, metal. So you, if you have a change in ruthenium on alumina or ruthenium on a carbon, you have a difference in the product distribution. So that means I had to wisely choose which support I should be using for which reaction. So that is very, very important. If you really want to do any reaction, you have to choose the metal you have to choose the support wisely. Now, what uh, further he has done is, for instance, you can see here, this is a platinum on alumina. And uh, as I have shown in earlier one of the slide, that just addition of tin, so to the platinum will change the product distribution. So here you can see this red color is a xylitol formation from xylose. So here you can see my activity is only this much or the selectivity for xylitol formation. But if I add tin, may then my activity boosts. So there is a 37% increase in the activity. But at the same time, if you do the same thing with the ruthenium, then with ruthenium, if I have this, this activity, and if I add tin to it, my activity decreases. So there is a change in the uh, activity. So it is not always true that if I add a tin, for instance, I'm just saying in my catalyst, uh, along with the metal, 
sometimes it can increase the yield or sometimes it can decrease the yield. So it all depends. So it is very, uh, there is a dynamics involved in all these. I will not go into the much details of it because if I have to explain, maybe it will take at least one or two hours just to explain all these things. So let's have just overview of what exactly happens. So maybe, so what might be happening is maybe the teen is bringing in the acidity. Why I'm saying that is because with teen, you have the higher furfural formation in this reaction. For instance, this is the green color is a furfural formation, right? So here there is no much furfural, but here the furfural formation has increased when I added the teen. So in case of ruthenium, when it is on a uh, carbon support, then maybe my teen is increasing the acidity because teen is present in a plus uh, oxidation state. I will come uh, to that. But when you have the platinum on aluminum catalyst, then teen actually will lower. So this green color, when there is no teen here, uh, and when there is a teen over here, it has decreased. So for formation. So in one place, maybe my teen is giving acidity, and my one product is increasing. In another case, that product is decreasing. So this is very interesting, right? So it is, it is very important to synthesize a catalyst, which product you want, and how you will uh, achieve that. So this is just uh, overall uh, one example where there is a teen content we have increased from 0 to 3.5% along with the platinum. So if you see initially when there is an increase in the teen content from 0 to 0.22, there is an increase in the xylitol formation, right? And then there is a decrease in the furfural formation. But as you go on increasing the teen content, maybe after a certain time, my furfural formation increases and my xylitol formation decreases. Now, I told you earlier that my furfural formation from xylose is an acid catalyzed reaction. So maybe after certain amount of teen is incorporated, further teen plays an acidity role and it starts giving me more and more furfural. So how that happens, we'll just see in the next couple of slides. So this is the XRD we do to understand uh, which are the uh, phases are formed and all. So here you can see very clearly that when you have a platinum as to teen ratio, one as to zero, then one as to one. So you can see there is a difference. There is There are only one, two, three, or uh, four peaks, major peaks over here. But when you start adding more and more teen, as you increase the more teen content, then you can see that another some peaks formation is observed, which is not there here. So this is for pt 3 ascent type of a species. Okay, so maybe now there is a teen which is giving a another species uh, formation. So whether that would be uh, that would be responsible for giving me change in my activity. So this is again for the acidity measurement and all. I will not go into the details of it. And this is the electronic state study. So suppose for instance, when I have a uh, Teen in 0.43 percentage along with platinum, I see only teen plus two state. But when I go into higher uh, teen content, then I get some teen in the zero state also along with uh, teen in plus two state. So that changes my electronic structure. That changes my uh, activity profile depending on the that. So then normally uh, slightly a deviation. So when we prepare this uh, platinum on teen catalyst. So typically we have to add HCl into that because HCl addition only will dissolve the uh, tin precursor and then only it can be um, impregnated or it can be supported on the support. So what we thought is that if there is a chloride ion is present in the um, catalyst, whether that affects the activity and all. So for that we did the study and then finally we observed that there, there is a slight uh, change in the uh, activity profile when we have some chlorine present. So when you are making a catalyst, you have to be very careful about uh, whether the chlorine, if you are using, whether it is completely removed or not. If it is not removed, then what would be the con uh, consequences of that onto the reaction and all. So all that you have to check. Now coming back to the understanding of the T role of tin. So typically platinum on alumina, Suppose if this is the catalyst, as I showed earlier, there would be a sintering. These species will interact with each other and then they will form the bigger particles like this, right? I hope you are understanding because I showed you 
earlier in the sintering effect. But when I have a teen in between, that maybe my teen is stopping these platinum particles to come in contact with each other. So there would be this formation of small to bigger particle will be stopped because my teen is dispersed and then it will stop agglomeration or sintering of my platinum particles. But at the same time, this teen can also act as a promoter effect because that we have seen in the catalytic active sites uh, or the uh, selectivity of the product uh, changing. So this is what the understanding effect of uh, teen. So you have a platinum in zero state, then you have a teen in plus delta state. So this is what the mechanism is. I will not go into the details of it. There would be a um, uh, carbonyl uh, bond uh, polarization will happen and then the reaction will happen fast and all because since it is a hydrogenation reaction, the polarization of carbonyl bond will uh, alter the hydrogenation activity. So this is what the overall uh, thing is. So if you have a teen in your uh, uh, catalyst along with the platinum, it will stop the sintering and also it will boost the uh, activity of my catalyst. So this is one of the way how you can manipulate the activity of the catalyst. So this is one of the example which I have given. Uh, so first is in hydrogenation of uh, sugars, yield of sugar alcohol can be increased because of addition of teen and uh, stopping of the agglomeration of platinum. And enhancement in the yield uh, is governed not only by the promoter, but it is a combined effect of pro uh, promoter and support interaction, which I have not explained to you, but uh, because of lack of time, we cannot go much into the details of it. So this is the sim uh, 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 part summary of the uh, presentation which I have made. Now let's go to the next uh, version. I have given you one example of uh, how the supported metal catalyst activity can be tuned by changing their uh, catalyst synthesis and all. So now let's move slightly towards the solid acid catalyst. Uh, so as I said, in heterogeneous catalysis, you have the supported metal catalyst and solid acid and base catalyst. We will not talk much about the solid base catalyst today, but we'll just talk about some examples on solid acid catalyst. So these are the typical solid acid catalyst. These are the zeolites, you might have heard about it, mesoporous materials, heteropoly acids, uh, hierarchical zeolitic materials, metal oxides and all. So these are the typical um, solid acid catalysts. Of course, there are many more solid acid catalysts, but I will not go into the details of it. Otherwise it will confuse uh, the students that what exactly is happening. So now people must have heard about this nano, nano, something is in catalysis that nano, uh, particles, nano catalysis, and all. So, what is this nano in the catalysis? That the supports are in the nano dimensions, or supported metal catalysts are in the nano size, and all. So, let's uh, let's go a bit about the, what is this nano. So, nano scale is the world of the very small, literally from one tenth million to one billionth of a millimeter, and this is what is there. So, the grain of the sand is almost one millimeter. Then it reduces to atom, which is 0 0.1 nanometer. And in catalysis, normally we talk about uh, from one nanometer to uh, further nanometers. And also in case of uh, zeolitic materials and all, we can go into Armstrong units and all. So this is just a per uh, perspective of nano. So does size matter? Yes, size does matter. So this is one of the example. You have the pipes of the different dimensions or different internal diameters. This is a bigger, this is a smaller. So you all know, you have all seen this. And then uh, if you have uh, water flowing, of course, the more water will come through these compared to these and also size really does matter in our daily life. But whether the size does matter in catalysis, that yes, it also matters. But let's, before going to that, let's consider what is uh, in catalysis, there is another concept. We call it as a, a microporous material, mesoporous material and macroporous material. So the, uh, where the particle size of the nanometer or the porous structure is less than two nanometer, it is called as a microporous. The porous structure is between two to uh, 50 nanometer is a mesoporous and more than 50 is a macroporous. So what is all, all, all about this? So this is the thing that you have the pore diameter, different pore diameter from 0.5 to 100 nanometer. Then the zeolites will sit into this place where you have the uh, porosity of 0.5 nanometer, 1 nanometer, 2 nanometer, then you have some clay materials and all, then you have the mesoporous materials which fall under 2 nanometers to uh, 50 nanometer, then you have the gels, then glasses and all which can go into the macroporous domain. 
So this is what the general uh, thing is. So when you are designing and uh, mm -hmm. synthesizing a new solid organic inorganic material, then you have to have the aim to have the more surface area and more activity, more selectivity, longevity, and durability. These are the things which we normally see when you synthesize any uh, solid material. So let's discuss only about microporous materials today. We will not go into the mesoporous and macroporous materials because otherwise it will be a too much long uh, talk. So let's consider the microporous materials which are less than two nanometer. So these are the zeolites which uh, we often find in our, uh, you know, wherever we go, we see some shiny materials on the, uh, you know, on the soil. We go somewhere here and there in the fields and all. These are not normally naturally occurring zeolitic materials. So what are these zeolites? When we talk about zeolites, zeolites, the zeolites are nothing but uh, it is a Greek uh, uh, word, a mixture of boil and stone. So it is a boiling stone and uh, it is coined in 18th century and all. I will not go into the much details of it, but I will just say that zeolites are nothing but the aluminosilicates. So suppose if you have a silica and if you have aluminum, then you can silicon and aluminum can react to each other and then they form a framework, which is also called as a molecular use and also called as a zeolites if it is a crystalline proper material. So let's not go into the much details of it and uh, move towards the synthesis of zeolite. So I showed you uh, some of the naturally occurring zeolites, but whether you can synthesize these zeolites in the lab. Yes, in the lab, you can synthesize these zeolites. Like you can, uh, from this framework of uh, silicon and aluminum, you can synthesize the zeolites like Pojocyte, ZSM5 and ZSM22 and all. I'll again not go into the details of it. You can have thousands of different varieties of zeolitic materials which you can synthesize from silicon and aluminum. So this is the basic structure of uh, zeolite where you will have a silicon which is tetrahedrally uh, coordinated. There will be oxygen, then there will be aluminum. And then because of all these structures, there will be some acids, uh, acid sites uh, formed into these uh, maybe Lewis acid sites, bronze tree acid sites. I'll just show you the structure of it. But uh, before going to that, uh, these zeolites look like this. It is kind of a white powder. And this is a tame image, and this is the same image. You can see that uh, there is a, a structure like a ball and all. Again, I will not go much into the details of it. Just imagine that there is a zeolite, which is aluminum silicate. Now, there are different arrangements, ways of stacking. So one can stack these pipes like these, one can stack uh, randomly, uh, one can uh, stack them properly. Here also those are uh, uh, stacked properly, here also pro stacked properly, but then you can see the orientations are completely different. So this is how the uh, framework of zeolite happens. So there would be a different, different stacking, different, different pore size and all. So how it affects in your reaction. So yes, it, uh, uh, it really affects, and also there is a possibility whether the uh, channels are open or closed. If those are closed, then maybe your molecules cannot go inside. If those are open, then your molecules can go inside. So all these factors come into the picture. Now there can be uh, different shapes of the pores. Some pores can be circular, some pores can be hexagonal, some pores can be of different, different size. And that also all you can synthesize with different, different ways and there are different ways of synthesizing it. And if there is a change in the shape of the pore, again, your activity will change, your reactivity will change and all. So uh, this is a pore size effect. For instance, now we have come back to the same uh, uh, photo of earlier. And if you have a benzene molecule, then whether this benzene molecule can go inside this, whether the benzene molecule can go inside this, but whether the benzene molecule can go inside this. So there is a possibility that if you go on changing that uh, pore size, then there is a possibility that this benzene molecule cannot go, uh, can, can go into these pores, but cannot go into this. So just imagine that you have a tennis ball and you have the different uh, uh, pipes with different uh, pore diameters. So there is a possibility that the tennis ball can go in one pipe and it can go in another pipe, but there is a possibility that it cannot go into the third pipe because the size of the pipe or the diameter of the internal diameter of the pipe is small. So same happens in case of uh, reactions also that maybe reactant molecules can go inside or cannot go inside. So for instance, let's see this. 
So maybe there is a possibility that my this molecule can go inside, but then there is a naphthalene molecule, maybe it is not possible to go inside this. So there is a pore size effect. So if you have the two reactants, one of this size and another is of this size, there is a possibility that this can go inside and can have the reaction within, or this molecule cannot go inside. So then it comes to shape selectivity and size exclusion and all. I'll not go into the much details of it, but just to understand that there is a possibility that pores can play a very major role in allowing the reactant to go inside or not. So uh, this is what is uh, a very important figure in uh, zeolite chemistry. There is a reactant selectivity, as I showed you on the earlier slide, possibly this can go inside, can react, the, uh, can do the reaction, and then it can split into two molecules, but then this molecule cannot go inside. So there is a possibility that this reactant can go, but this reactant cannot go. So this is called as a reactant selectivity. Then there is a product uh, selectivity that these two reactants can go inside, they can have the reaction, but then the possibility is that these two molecules, these two products cannot come outside because there is no space for it to come out. Only a para substituted can come outside because it fits the size of the pore. And then there is a restricted transition state selectivity so whether the transition state can be this, this cannot be possible because it is bigger than the pore which is present inside, but this can go. So there is a three types of selectivity, is reactant selectivity, product selectivity, and restricted transition state selectivity. So this all comes into the picture when we are designing the catalyst, when we are doing the reaction. So all this has to be kept in the mind. Now let's come back to acid sites present on uh, the zeolite. As I said that there would be a uh, silicon and aluminum and oxygen uh, framework of the zeolite. So it can give rise to the bronze acid sites and Lewis acid sites. I will not go into the details of what are bronze acid sites and Lewis acid sites. All of you must be knowing donation of protons or acceptance of electrons. This is the basic difference between uh, these two sites. And this is the bronze acid site in a zeolite and this is the Lewis acid site in a zeolite. Now going further, this is uh, how reactors penetrate inside the channels. As I have shown earlier, I will not go into the details of it uh, or to confuse you. So uh, just coming to the mesoporous material, just slightly two slides on this. So mesoporous materials are between two to 50 nanometer, as I have uh, showed you earlier. So there is a possibility that uh, this molecule can go inside, but maybe this molecule uh, cannot go inside of this, right? But this molecule can go inside this. So there is a restriction of the uh, porosity. So this is a microporous material where the size is small, this, this reactant cannot go, but then there is a mesoporous material where the size is bigger, so the reactant molecule can go inside, right? So I hope you have understood that. So these are the mesoporous materials, typically MCM41, which has a channel structure and uh, all. I will not again go into the details of it much, and it has a, a, a pore opening or pore channel of around 2 to uh, 2.2 nanometer, uh, 220 nanometer, you can change depending on how you prepare it, but typically it is in the range of 2.2 to 3 nanometer uh, size so that molecules can go. Uh, and if you remember, we talked about these microporous materials, zeolites and all, they have the pore diameter of not more than 2 nanometer. Typically they have the pore diameter of 0.5 to 1.2, 1.3 nanometers. And in case of mesoporous material, they have the uh, size of more than 2.2 nanometer. So this is the, how do they look, um, a mesoporous material. You can see very clearly, this is the framework and you can see inside, these are the channel structures in uh, perpendicular figure. You can see that there are channels present in that and all. So uh, typically this, uh, uh, mesoporous materials are not uh, silicon and aluminum uh, materials. So there is a lack of uh, acidity. So how to overcome that lack of acidity or basicity? So you can do some anchoring. You can do, if you have this type of a surface with OH, you can do uh, amine uh, sites, uh, grafting, or you can do CN, you can do SH and all, or you can do acidic. So I'm just giving you an example. You can have the basic sites on it or acidic sites on it. And this is what uh, one of the example is that if you have this starch molecule, which is a bigger, it cannot go into the uh, pores of zeolite. But if you have a mesoporous material with some sulfonation 
uh, done on the it can go inside do the reaction on these acid sites this is the typical hydrolysis reaction and you can get the hydrolysis product out of it now another one uh, is uh, example i will just give uh, this is very interesting example this work is done uh, in my group uh, by uh, a few of my students actually multiple of my students uh, even uh, sagar i think you are there on the call so sagar also has done some work on this and this is the identification of the product and the focus so when you are doing any reaction so this is the glucose which is always present in the cyclic form which has to first go into open chain form if it has to isomerize into fructose so glucose to fructose we know that there is it is a simple isomerization reaction but then there is a equilibrium because normally out of 1000 molecule 998 molecules are present in cyclic form and only two molecules are present in the open chain and unless and until it comes into the open chain it cannot go into uh, isomerization so this is the first equilibrium then there is a second equilibrium that there is a possibility that uh, 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 50% molecules will remain these and 50% molecules will remain these so this is the second equilibrium in the reaction third equilibrium is again going back into um, open chain form into cyclic form and then you get this pyridoxymethyl furfuran this is one of the important chemical uh, which we are synthesizing in our uh, group so you can understand you have to overcome so many uh, equilibriums like first equilibrium second equilibrium third equilibrium and fourth equilibrium because it's a dehydration reaction so there is a possibility that reaction can come back then there is another possibility that self uh, self condensation reactions can happen and all why i am telling all these is because for all these you require different different catalyst so typically normally for these to happen you require a base catalyst for this to happen you require a lewis acid or base to happen for this to happen you require a bronzed acidity so when you are synthesizing a catalyst for this transformation you have to synthesize a catalyst which has a lewis acidity and bronzed acidity on the catalyst surface so these are the typical other solid acid catalysts like amber is uh, resins napion carbon and mesoporous materials and all i will not go into the details of it i have already talked about the bronzed acid sites and lewis acid sites already so again i will not go much into the details of it now designing of the catalyst so basic to applied science so for instance when you talk about this isomerization you require a lewis acid site then only a isomerization can happen i have shown it over here i will not go into the details of uh, the mechanism then if you really want to do the dehydration then again you have to have a bronzed acid site uh, so h plus is required to do this reaction at the same time if you are doing this reaction in a water medium and your glucose is soluble in water and your catalyst is a uh, heterogeneous catalyst which is a solid catalyst then a catalyst can have a hydrophilic or hydrophobic nature now this is very important because if you have the oh 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 on the catalyst surface then this surface becomes very hydrophilic but if you take a glucose molecule this is a glucose molecule it has a hydrophilic and hydrophobic both the nature when you have uh, so many oh groups it becomes a hydrophilic and when you have the carbon uh, uh, structure then you have a hydrophobicity so when you are synthesizing a catalyst you should have a proper balance between hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity so that there would be a proper interaction between the catalyst surface and a, a reactant molecule so i am not going into the results at all but i am just see is telling you the complexity in a simple looking reaction and how your catalyst synthesis uh, is very important for instance if you have a bronzed acidity and if it is much much more for instance right then maybe humine formation or char formation will happen so this is a bronzed acidity if you have low bronzed acidity the yields will be less if you have high, optimum bronzed acidity then you have uh, a proper yield but if you the strength increases again the activity will go down because the further reactions will happen same is true with the uh, concentration of bronzed acidity you can see over here then time also plays very important role as uh, time increases the activity will increase but as time increases further maybe you have you have the uh, side reactions happening the same is true with the lewis acid concentration so as lewis acid uh, increases sides increases or the concentration on the catalyst increases then you have the higher isomerization 
So this Lewis acid Di2 dew is very important to do the isomerization from glucose to uh, fructose and further prostate acid is required for, for uh, fructose to dehydration reaction to give the fire, uh, HMF as a product. And uh, substrate solubility is also very, very important. So complexity in a simple looking reaction. So the pores are very important because you are, uh, if the catalyst having a porosity, which is suitable for um, reactants to go inside. So for instance, this is the glucose molecule. It can go inside, but it cannot go inside here, right? So the pores is important. Accessibility of the inner uh, active sites, which are present inside, uh, is also very important. Then the stability of this is also important. There is a possibility that you have the uh, porosity in the initial stage, but as you do the reaction, the, there is a deformation of the catalyst, and then maybe this catalyst will not be uh, suitable for the next reaction. And at the same time, you have to have a catalyst surface which is not completely hydrophobic and not completely hydrophilic, because if it is hydrophobic, maybe these OH groups cannot come near, near to, uh, because these are hydrophilic, they cannot come near to the catalyst surface. And if it is too hydrophilic, then there is a possibility that water will poison the catalyst surface, and then maybe substrate cannot have an interaction with the catalyst surface. So you have to have an optimum. So you can see that whatever we discussed until now, the porosity, accessibility, stability has come into the picture over here in this example. So then there is another example, which is a conversion of hemicellulose into uh, some chemical, like you can go into xylose and arabinose. This is a polysaccharide, which can go into even furfural. And then uh, the activity changes. I will not go into, again, details of these. These are the solid acid catalyst uh, porosity and all. I'll just talk about now two uh, or three, maybe two uh, catalysts. One is a H modinite, which is a zeolitic material, and another is a SAPO44, which is also a zeolitic material. And you can see that there is a, some change in the uh, properties of uh, this catalyst. But how those play the role in the reaction, we'll just see. So let's consider that the uh, only right side we will uh, emphasize, we will not see the left side. So if there is a H modernite catalyst and there is a SAPO catalyst, both are zeolitic materials and then there is a 71% connectivity and 88% connectivity to the product which we are uh, seeing, like from fructose to HMF, right? So there is a change in the selectivity. Why this change in the selectivity has happened? Because of some change in the catalyst property or some change in the catalyst. Now, this is a hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity study. This is uh, work done in my group by, with, uh, by one of the uh, PhD students. So what is, I, I talked about the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity earlier, and now uh, let me explain it to you uh, in big detail. So uh, this is the SAPO and modernite. So you just consider this is a water and then this is a CCL4. CCL4 being a more dense, it is uh, at the bottom and water is up. So you can see that there is a H modernite suspended, there is a SAPO5 and there is a SAPO44. So H modernite, you can see, after even 10 minutes of suspension, it is evenly distributed in both the phases. But at the same time, the SAPO is at the, uh, at the middle of uh, your organic phase and water phase. Why is it so? Because SAPO is more hydrophilic compared to H modernite. If it is more hydrophilic, it should come into the water phase. Now to prove it in a different way, so this is the MIBK and water. You can see this is H modernite and this is SAPO44. You can see after 10 minutes, still H modernite is more present in organic phase compared to water phase. But in case of SAPO44, you can see that not much of SAPO44 is present in organic. It is uh, accumulating in between of uh, these two phases. And then this is the density difference of SAPO44 and H modernite. So we can see that hydrophilicity is, in case of SAPO44, hydrophilicity is much more than H modernite. And what we discussed in the earlier slide, if I take you back to that slide, uh, there the hydrophilicity is very important in carrying out this reaction. The surface should not be too hydrophobic and too hydrophilic also. So that is what is we manipulated in our work that, uh, uh, reaction can happen that way. And then, of course, the reaction was done in a biophysics system. So in case of SAPO44, the catalyst is in this phase. 
in a water phase, this is the catalyst particle. And in case of modernite catalyst, some of the catalyst is present in water, some of the catalyst is present in the organic phase that I have shown you earlier. So because of that, there is a possibility that once this uh, reaction happens, this product goes in, because this is an organic molecule, it goes into the organic phase. But since there is no catalyst over here, it doesn't go under any further reactions. But since in case of modernite, there is a uh, catalyst again over here, it can react with uh, the, the product HMF can have an interaction with the catalyst and it can give the some undesirable products. So I hope you might have understood that what I want to convey to you, that hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity is very, very important. So this is very much important when you are designing a catalyst for a particular reaction. So going further, this is, uh, so we have shown the recyclability of the catalyst, the catalyst is stable and again for glucose to and all. So in the summary, it is very important to keep in mind what you wish to have from your catalyst and accordingly design and synthesize the catalyst. So catalyst synthesis is not a job of just doing the synthesis. It is like you have to apply brain, you have to apply logic to understand what properties I want in my catalyst and accordingly I will synthesize my catalyst because the catalyst properties are very dependent on the reaction which you want to carry out. So if you want to carry out any particular reaction, accordingly you have to develop a catalyst and better to know the things first and then work on it. Instead of you do something and then finally you find out, oh, maybe this is not working. So it is always better to understand things first, what exactly is requ uh, required from my catalyst and all. So that's all from my uh, uh, presentation today. I think I have taken almost an hour uh, to make a presentation. So finally, I would like to acknowledge funding agencies, ACL and my group members, and Dr. Baba Sahib Matsagar, a PhD student who worked with me and now he is in Taiwan uh, doing his postdoc and I, th I know he is very well connected with your college. And uh, thanks for him for uh, uh, introducing me to your college and because of him, uh, I'm able to give you a talk uh, today. And also some years back, I visited your college, maybe four or five years back and that time also I make, made a presentation to you. And then the organizing committee of Department of Chemistry, VP Mahavidyala Vaijapur for giving me the opportunity uh, Principal Professor Thore, then uh, coordinator for STRIDE, uh, Dr. Sandeep Pardeshi. I understand this uh, lecture is in a series of uh, STRIDE uh, program. And then uh, Dr. Baba Sa Dada Saheb uh, Salunke and convener uh, Dr. Uh, Zine, who is a head, and co convener uh, Dr. JP Sonar, who was in contact with me uh, from Department of Chemistry for uh, this uh, talk. And uh, the work which I presented in this uh, uh, presentation were done by Dr. Anup Pathod. He is a scientist now at, at the moment in IIP Dehradun and Prasanajit Bhomi, who has uh, joined uh, IOCL and he is working in IOCL company. Uh, so thank you very much uh, once again. And if you have any questions, please ask me, no issues. And then if you have any questions at later date, that time also you can always contact me through email uh, and then I would be happy to answer uh, the questions. As I said, I tried to give a, just an overview of uh, what a catalyst synthesis can do by taking some few simple examples from the work which we have done. But of course, these all topics uh, may demand at least a one full day uh, presentation on all the topics because it is a vast, vast area. Uh, but I thought I will just give you an overview of how the catalyst properties and synthesis affects the uh, reaction paths and all. So thank you very much once again. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Now uh, the session is open for the discussion. Any question from the student side or the participant side? Uh, Paresh, sir, can I request you to on your video? Okay, thank you. Any question from the participants? You can directly ask your questions. Okay, I I uh, I have one question from my side, sir. Uh, Please. What are the new hot topics in the catalysis? 
there are many hot topics in catalysis at this moment. Uh, one of the hot topic is the CO2 utilization because now you know uh, the CO2 emissions have crossed a few years back 400 ppm and global warming is happening. And also we are uh, uh, assigning to COP21 uh, uh, treaty. So we had to reduce our CO2 uh, mitigation. So we had to do the mitigation of CO2. So that CO2 utilization is one of the main topic. Then there is a possibility of hydrogen energy. Uh, you might have seen that uh, in recent times, government of India has come up with uh, a roadmap on hydrogen energy. So there is a possibility that how you can synthesize hydrogen by different different ways by doing the reforming reactions or electrolyzers and all. So that is one of the uh, hot topic. Then of course crude to oil. Uh, this is a new topic wherein, uh, for instance, until now we were using crude for uh, fuel uh, purpose more mainly, and of course for chemical synthesis. Uh, but at the same time now, uh, maybe the fuel demand in future may go down, uh, which we get from petroleum feedstock because hydrogen energy is coming into the picture, batteries are coming into the picture and all. So there is a possibility, there is a work going on for crude oil to direct conversion into chemicals instead of going into the fuels. And of course, since I am working in biomass, so maybe the biomass also is one of the topic. But yes, it is a hot topic, but not as such uh, compared to the CO2 and hydrogen and uh, uh, crude to chemicals. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one more question from students. They have asked that, uh, Zeolites are acidic or basic? Uh, zeolites can be both acidic and basic. It is just a matter of a change of uh, counter ion. Normally, zeolite has a, a negative uh, charge, the surface, and then you compensate it with uh, positive charge. If you compensate it with uh, H+, plus, then it will become acidic. If you compensate it with Na+, plus, it will become basic. So. There is a possibility that zeolite can be acidic and basic, both. So we can convert them into acid as well as the basic as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you can, you can very well. Uh, one more question is there. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, what are the research area of catalysis for a new researcher? Well, like us, where we should, we should uh, focus on? Uh, as I told, uh, there are many areas, like as I said, uh, at least particularly for government of India, from India perspective, if you see, uh, as I said, CO2 utilization is there, then hydrogen uh, generation is there. Then of course, uh, crude to chemicals, as I mentioned, and besides that biomass utilization. And of course, see, the thing is that uh, chemical reactions are not going to go anywhere, right? So it is always possibility that you can always um, uh, do some, uh, uh, you know, new catalyst development for increasing the efficiencies of the reactions uh, to get the selective products. And also at the same time to stabilize the catalyst, how to stop the poisoning of the catalyst, deactivation of the catalyst and all. So there are always uh, areas to work on it is a ocean and then what you choose from that is just a drop. So there are multiple areas. So if you get, if you really want to do anything, you have to just uh, go through the roadmaps of the catalysis, which are there on uh, internet or also you can just go through the reviews published and also uh, the recent papers. So you will get an idea. So there are many, many areas wherein you can work on. Any question from the participant side? Yes, I have one question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, <laughs> yes, sir. It's a really, very really long time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I, okay. I requested to Sagar uh, just to give me, send me the link. I will sure, join. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, sir. So, yeah, it's a really an amazing and extraordinary talk, sir, about the catalysis. You have covered uh, really from basic to advanced about the uh, catalyst, pore size, acidity, and base. means that's a uh, reactivity and add up. Uh, at all. So, sir, uh, my questions about you have covered the heterogeneous catalysis part and yeah. you have shown the selectivity, size, other things like a char formation. So, uh, I, I couldn't see, sir, any 
of the reaction about the homogeneous catalysis where we can come up with the problem for the uh, like uh, pore size uh, and uh, like uh, selectivity. So maybe just uh, uh, for my curiosity, how we can uh, like modify it or tune the catalysis system for the glucose conversion into HMF. Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, Sandeep. Uh, I, 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 I said in the beginning that, uh, see, this is a big, uh, you know, area of, uh, uh, you know, to talk about. So I just restricted on the heterogeneous catalysis and in heterogeneous also, I just gave one example. As you know, there might be thousands of examples, thousands of uh, different perspectives you, which you can uh, look into. Of course, homogeneous is one of the major uh, uh, area to look into and it, as you said, it will overcome the drawbacks of uh, uh, heterogeneous catalysis, but at the same time, it homogeneous has its own uh, cons also. So there is a possibility that in homogeneous and heterogeneous, both pros and cons are there. Uh, but if given an opportunity next time, sometime I will make a presentation on homogeneous catalysis also. And I know from where it is coming because you have worked on <laughs> homogeneous catalysis and also of course, uh, uh, Sagar has uh, I mean, uh, Sagar also has worked on uh, homogeneous catalysis, uh, but purposefully I have not given any uh, you know examples on uh, homogeneous catalysis because I thought that maybe Sagar also had made a presentation uh, to the college, so I thought maybe he might have given the same uh, kind of a talk. So I don't want it to repeat it, uh, but only just to give an example, I gave some Anup's. Uh, uh, work over here, uh, but definitely if there is a possibility, I can uh, give a talk on homogeneous, or you yourself can uh, give a talk on homogeneous catalysis in the college. So homogeneous catalysis, of course, again is as you said, uh, it is a vast area and uh, uh, it can overcome this uh, porosity problem and it can give the reactions. Uh, like for instance, what you talked about, glucose to HMF or fructose to HMF. Very, very, very much possible. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, Baba sir, you can ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, hello, Sagar. Uh, hello, actually, I don't have any question, but I cannot stop myself to talk with you. <laughs> really wonderful talk, and I really learned a lot of, like, how to engineer a catalyst for a specific reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it is nice to see you and uh, Sandeep after a long, long time. Uh, we talked over uh, phone, but uh, you know, it is uh, after a long time, uh, video call kind of is there. Yeah, so. <laughs> Same <laughs> here, sir. Nice, so, yeah. nice to see both of you. Yeah, see, I tried here, to sir. give a very basic uh, talk here, just for because maybe I thought maybe students uh, will be there and for them to understand things, uh, you know, it would be really, if I go into the much details, then it would be uh, very difficult for them to understand. So just try to give a very basic talk. Let me tell you, sir, we are always discussing uh, with the Baba Sahib uh, about this, uh, your research. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, from his discussion, I come to know that you are very good human kind, sir. As well yeah, as actually, sir. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Sagar is uh, one of my good students and also Sandeep. So, actually, I am yeah. fortunate that uh, I had uh, uh, very good students who were like... Uh, very forthcoming and doing the reactions and all and understanding the effects and all. So good that you are in contact with uh, Sagar and then Sagar also is in good contact with uh, other uh, uh, earlier group members and all. So it will, I hope it will definitely help you in doing some research at your college level because Sagar comes to, see, we sitting at NCR may not be knowing what are the facilities available at your place and all, but maybe Sagar, since he is coming from there, he is more uh, attached to the college, he knows what are the facilities available and all. So he may uh, guide you or he may tell you more like what more you can do and all. So Sagar, maybe uh, you might be doing that, but if you are not, uh, maybe you can put more efforts in letting them know what they can uh, do more in the uh, research in uh, facilities, whatever are available uh, at uh, college level. Yeah, sure, sir. <laughs> Okay, any question from the participants?
maybe everybody might have gone for uh, lunch or something like that it is true but you find out i think they are satisfied with yourself sir you know maybe sometimes it happens that they don't want to ask any questions maybe later on they will be having some questions they may come and ask but you know if you have any questions you can always write to me uh, that's not a issue or maybe of course you can always write to sagar also and uh, sagar also can answer most of the questions uh, whatever i have uh, made a presentation and uh, if not maybe those can be diverted to me no issues okay so i think uh, uh, we are going to the last part of this lecture uh, on behalf of the department of chemistry vp mahavidyalaya vaidapur i am thankful to you sir you have wonderfully explained everything what like the what is the catalysis what are the kinds of catalyst what are the typical surface of a catalyst and supported reactions like the terrace hole step edges etc that are helping in the catalysis also you have explained very wonderfully adsorption desorption catalytic phenomenon you have also explained the relevance of the size and the selectivity that was uh, new for us uh, what are the sintering effect this was also not known to us what is the sintering effect and how we can overcome that sintering effect how we can convert the xylose into the xylitol and arabitol you also explained the catalytic micro porous material and the meso porous materials zeolites preparation and their activities also the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity how it helps in the catalysis you are, you are explain that with example uh, i am again very much thankful that you have taken your very busy schedule your time from a very busy schedule uh, i am also thankful to dr baba saheb who helped to organize these lectures also uh, uh, sandeep sir you are having very wonderful conversation with us also uh i am thankful to our principal dr s n thore for guiding us on this lecture organization i am also thankful to strand coordinator dr s d pardesh sir and iqc coordinator dr dada saheb sarunke sir for giving uh, opportunity to organize this lecture series i am also thankful to all participants who have joined this program and with the permission of our uh head dr jinesh sir uh, i uh, declare that uh, this lecture is concluded but uh, the we will definitely need your help sir in future to grow in research field yeah sure so as i mentioned uh, you can always contact me no issues about it yes yeah, thank you thank you thank you sir bye sir <laughs> bye bye, bye. bye. nice seeing uh, sagar and sandeep yes <laughs> after after long time Yes, sir. Same here. <laughs> Same here, sir. Okay, sure. I always try to reach you, sir. But it looks yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, almost everybody. Hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost yes, everybody sir. is in contact, like uh, starting from Deepa to the recent student. So it is good to see that you people are doing good and then uh, are in contact with each other also. That is most important because that is what is uh, you know like you and Sagar are in contact and who. Uh, all of you are in uh, contact that is much much important to grow together okay then yeah bye 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 is there any feedback for today oh uh, i think uh, you are registered for this program yes. we will send the uh, feedback form on the registration link okay on your email sir